I am Fred Lee, former president of the Leicester Secular Society. I was walking, I moved to Leicester in 1991, and I was walking down the street in Humberstone Gate and saw the sign in the window, Leicester Secular Society, meetings at 6.30. I thought this was rather interesting, so I came to the meetings and became involved. Right. And uh, at, what, at that time, what, uh, what was the society like? Well... It's hard to remember precisely in 1991, 92, uh, in part because the society was been quite dynamic in the 1970s and 1980s, but that dynamism had come to an end. And the person who was the president, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, um, he was a farmer out um, south of Leicester, and he was having problems with his farm, I believe, at least certainly a lot of work it became less and less attentive to the society. So there was a kind of um, disorganization within the society, if I remember correctly. So the society wasn't as vibrant as it, it could have been, certainly from the 1980s. And I just stumbled in on the society at this time. Uh, this would be 91. I became part of the committee within the society, probably around 93. You know, when you find a sucker that's willing to join committees, you know, you rope them in immediately. And then I became president, almost by default, because nobody else really wanted it, and I was willing to be active and take, take on the job of, of doing the various things that president would do. Uh, so I became active in that particular way. So that, that's how the society was. What kind of political in Britain at the time, do you remember? Well, um, one could say cons extremely conservative, reactionary. Since this was the time of still of Thatcher, um, it, was, it, was, it was that conservative. The society itself has always had a variety of political viewpoints. Uh, when I was there, there was this guy, Rupert Halfhide, who was actually somewhat conservative relative to the other members, uh, and that created some, some issues, not over secularism, but because of other kinds of activities or speakers society wanted to bring in. And we had a, a few others, and some of these other people who have been in society for many, many years, decades, um, started dropping out, and essentially the society was left with those who were, had a much more left-wing political perspective. Not totally irrelevant to secularism, but that's simply the way the society kind of moved in its membership, uh, or at least those who are active at this time. We still have a number of people who are fairly old, who were um, lifelong members or who paid their yearly subscription, but weren't, didn't actually engage in society activities, simply being too old. Society does have a long tradition of radical politics and in the history, doesn't it? Can we talk a little bit? Yes, yeah, society, the formation of society as a kind of working class, middle class, educational institution in a sense, started in 1851. Um, politically, whether it was free trade or socialism or individualism versus socialism, society actually split on these things. Members were engaged in both. You see it in the, in the lectureship series that they would have, say, in the 1880s. So you always had this, um, this uh, conservative, uh, progressive kind of split uh, politically, in, that, in a sense, in the society. But because they were all against anything to do with religion in the state, this was a very common theme, and the members of society always um, supported. So you could be conservative in one aspect and highly radical in something else. And that's what a lot of the members did. So while they disagreed on some political themes, there was a fairly unanimous viewpoint about religion in the state. And, of course, this is, can be seen as very radical, certainly in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. So in that sense, to be a member of society was always to be radical in some sense. Um, 
It's just that members were radical or conservative in other senses. So during the history of the society, if you could have chosen a time uh, to be a member of the secular society, when, when would you choose? Well, this is actually a curious question. The reason is, is that secularism grew from 1850 to the 1880s. And it grew because it was an alternative political force to at least some aspects of British society, where there was no other opposing political force. Socialism emerged in the 1880s, and it deals with issues of where you work and your job, which in some sense are a bit more substantive than worrying about religion in the schools, so to speak, or whether you can play sports in Victoria Park on a Sunday afternoon. So those who were interested in these kind of issues went into socialism, and the secularist tradition never accommodated to that, never moved with it, so to speak. So as a member of society, I would like to have been around 1890 when you started having development of socialist parties and have become involved in, a, in that particular realm. Uh, so that's why it's a very curious question, uh, because religion is totally irrelevant. Who cares about it? It's much more interesting to care about issues of socialism, better in the working class or, or whatever, than to care about whether you can play football in Victoria Park on Sunday. So that would have been a really interesting time to be a member of society and also been involved in, in socialist politics. Do you, do you think if those early secularists were around today, would they be worried about a comp completely different political agenda or the same thing? Oh, well, remember we had secularists who were very much interested in socialism, so they would be interested in all the issues that any socialist or whatever would be interested today. Um, the, um, the individualists in the society, say in the 1880s, this would be difficult because to, to answer the question, because they were around today. The notion of individualism or of uh, capitalism could have been permeated by a very paternalistic view of how capitalism is supposed to work. And that's been eliminated today. So they may actually f find today a much more nasty society than they would have liked. They would have preferred the paternalism of Macmillan, for example, in the third way back in the 1950s. Now, so I don't know the answer about how they would feel today if you had a secular um, come back today. I think one of the things they would find unfortunate about today is the vast majority of people don't want to learn, don't want to read, don't want to engage. As I stated earlier, the society when it was formed was as much about education as about anything else. And But this was part of a lot of Victorian institutions which were established in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, such as um, the what, Leicester City Museum, um, up on Newwalk, uh, that was that organization was established in around 1840 as an educational organization. Leicester Secular Society is simply part of that tradition, so they would be offended by the rampant stupidity that they would see among the wider members of society. They back then, if you're a working class and if you had the time off, they would. Uh, expect you to do something like go read, or go discuss. This is what they expected intelligent people to do. Of course, that's not what happens now. So in a sense, they would be very much uh, disappointed, uh, very much offended by how contemporary society de-emphasizes learning, self-learning, and self-engagement uh, in societies where you can engage and discuss and critically um, argue with each other. So do you think the society has an important role today? Yes, of course society has an important role today. Without the society or the National Secular Society or British Humanist Society, um, Blair and his um, idiots, I would have to say, want to impose religion on society, would have been able to do it without any, without any problem. The society and its uh, fellow societies maintain the tradition that Religion should not be part of the public sphere. And without it, the, 
without that kind of opposition, you would you would have a very quick um, transformation of the public sphere, um, which you're getting in any case, but without society and other groups like it, it would be even quicker. So this, obviously the society has an extremely important role today, if only to raise hell about what's going on. And what would you say particularly about Leicester Secular Society? For today, well, Leicester Secular Society should be holding forums, questioning any kind of religion in the schools, uh, creation of any faith schools, creation of any area which is then subject to social conventions, social laws that are not part of the uh, larger society social law, such as areas for Jewish law to hold or for Islamic uh, law to hold. Uh, they should oppose this. They should go out and campaign against it. And in fact, be um, very much up in their face. Because the only way this is going to be stopped, if you actually have a protest that verges on the side of, not violence, but certainly extreme activism, which would make people think, again, about thrusting religion down the throats of people because a few people want to dominate others. I think the younger people are less and less interested in religion, either opposing it or being involved with it. The churches are in decline, and the society is um, becoming more elderly in its demographic. So uh, it's difficult to get younger people involved. Have you got any advice for us? Well, um, when you say that society is becoming less and less religious, uh, I think there's a mistake there. What's happening is that society is becoming more polarized. And what we have are evangelical groups, for example, becoming whose membership is increasing rapidly, um, becoming much more forceful. And since they have links to Tory political party, they can, their small numbers can actually impose religion on the larger society. For example, it looks like you're going to have a problem with whether people can have abortions or not. Um, and if you're going to have religious statements or religious viewpoints informing social policy about abortion, then if the young people don't care about it, the young people are just going to get swept up. Um, so I wouldn't say the society has become less religious. In fact, um, being apathetic, apathetic to all this means that, in fact, you help promote religion. The only way to stop religion is to be actively opposing it. So, so in that sense, um, the youth are part of the problem. Uh, even though the mainline churches, Church of England is declining, Church of England was, hasn't been important in most aspects of society for at least 50 years. So. The only reason it maintains any any role is because it's an established church, but on ordinary daily lives, it has very little influence. Uh, but the evangelicals are what you have to deal with. So, what does society have to do? Society has to somehow um, create an issue that would generate interest, that would somehow grab the attention of some of the youth. Um, to expect that all the youth to uh, become involved is, I think, a, a pie in the sky, in part because there's such huge forces to make them so apathetic. Um, then I assume you mean youth 18 to 24 or something along that line. Uh, when you have employment policies in the, in the UK which uh, reproduces apathetic attitudes towards engage, large engagement society. That is, they're unemployed, they get benefits, but there's no notion that they have to become involved in society. So you, so you basically you buy off the youth so they don't revolt. I'm not sure how you can get around that. They're simply apathetic. So you have to come up with something. Certainly when I was president in the 90s, we tried to come up with some ideas. What kind of activities were going on in the 90s? And not much. We never were able to come up with anything that would be um, that that would be exciting. Uh, groups used to use the hall for more general uh, activities. Well, the best that we could come up with in the 90s 
and was that we'd simply have our lecture series. Uh, we, we had a table in Leicester City Center at the clock tower that generated some interest, not, not by the youth. Um, the, um, we, we really couldn't come up with anything that would generate a great deal of, great deal of excitement. Uh, I think it was in terms of a lull between the 80s, when there would have been a lot of other kinds of excitement. In the 90s, where uh, basically the drift to the right and apath being apathetic was, was paramount. And society tried to, in a sense, stem the flow, but it can't, it was, it was difficult. Uh, so I can't tell you what kind of activities that society actually needs to engage in. This is for the current president to be able to come up with plans to do so. Uh, it's, it's something which has to be, in a sense, locally constructed to deal with these kind of local issues. If I was going to be really um, uh, provocative, I would choose say a particular faith school that is being chartered or being set up and actually picket it um, and hand out flyers to some kind of a sense basically saying you're sending your children here they're being brainwashed they're giving a poor education um, something that would provoke a debate because these people will not debate with you not engage with you because they have the upper hand so somehow you need to do something. I don't advocate what the suffrage would do, throw themselves on the horses to get trampled to death to promote suffrage. So I don't expect members of society stand in front of cars and get run over at the local schools to try to promote um, sympathy for their side or whatever, but do something. Um, and say that you know religion is simply wrong. It shouldn't be imposed in the public sphere. And I have to ask you about the IWW. Would you in the industrial work, as it were, before you could join the secular society, and did you um, were you involved with that here? Or? Okay, this is a, um, an interesting <laughs> sideways from the um, Lester Secular Society. I joined the IWW in 1985, so I was a member prior to coming to Leicester in 1991. In Leicester, well, I arrived in England in 1990. I taught for a year at um, Stafford Polytechnic, uh, now Staffordshire University. I taught there for a year, then came and taught at um, the Montfort University, or then known as Leicester Polytechnic. Um, the IWW used to have a regional organizing committee in the UK. It kind of collapsed in the mid-1980s. Uh, it was centered in Leicester, and people like Lynn Hurst, for example, and Michael Gerard were members of this society. Uh, of the, I'm sorry, of, of the IWW. Um, maybe even Andrew Legg could have been a member, so member that was, of it. Was that based here at the Society? I'm not sure where it was, how it was located, mm -hmm. um, where they met. But I probably do think they met at the Society because the Society rents out rooms. And throughout the 1980s, even in the 1990s, many of the people who rented out these rooms were left-wing political groups having their monthly meeting or whatever. It was a well-known place to come to. Members of the society, such as Lynn Hurst, were anarchists back in the 70s. Michael Girard, anarchist back in the 70s. So they were, they were also involved in the society. So they're... they're um, work in the IWW, other political activities and society overlap. They would meet in the rooms of the society. So there was a, a real connection on an individual level between society members and, and these activities. So when I come, everything's at a lull, so I re, reinvigorate or reestablished the British Regional Organizing Committee for the IWW. And we had our office here in, in Secular Hall because we needed an address place, and we needed a room. And since 
if I became president and all this kind of stuff, I could actually establish all this stuff in the society. Uh, but it had nothing to do with society. It was simply just like any other group who rented out a room within the society. And, um, Partly, though, the society has a tradition of free speech and uh, giving a space for groups that maybe can't speak uh, or can't easily get a room somewhere else to come here to discuss. And that's part of the education kind of aspect of the society. That was never an issue because um, nobody would have ever thought otherwise. By the time I get to Leicester, if you're going to have a meeting, uh, you would have it at the Leicester Secular Society, full stop. Now, the society, the meetings of this sort of society declined in the 90s, not because of the society, but because these groups declined in the 90s. And they just simply cease to hold meetings. So, as far as I can remember now, you would always have your meetings here. There was, there was no problem. And you could always run out the hall. No problem. You could always do anything. No problem. You just come to the Leicester Secular Society. Where else would you go in the middle of Leicester? You had all the buses running. Of course, not now, but back then you had buses running in the evenings. You could actually do all this downtown. You know, that's how people thought. So they didn't go out to some outer place outside the city center to carry out these activities. They came downtown. And then finally, what do you feel about the future of the building, the actual physical building? Well, this is a very interesting building. Uh, built in 1880, 1881. And it was always designed to carry out secular activities and have a caretaker in the building. Now, over time, society declined in size, needed income, so it rents out part of the space of the building to maintain the society activities. And through the income, the building gets maintained as well. Now, in this context, the, the building as far as I'm concerned, can only be used for one main purpose, and that's for the Leicester Secular Society. When I was president, there was talk about selling off the building, using the funds to hold meetings elsewhere. Never went very far. I think it's been a talk that was actually even predated my arrival in 1991. The problem with that is that, first of all, this is a, a listed building, so you actually can't really change much on the outside. It's also a very strange, bu strangely built building, so it's very difficult to do much on the inside without totally eliminating the entire insides to make it a, something usable. So in a sense, it really only, really only has one purpose, that is to host a Leicester Secular Society. So, I, so as long as the society remains active, as members. They will always use this building. Now this is becoming, I understand, a difficult problem with the decline in bus services in the evening, so usage of the building becomes more difficult in the evenings. Uh, just have to figure out how to deal with that particular issue. If the society, well, if the society left the building, the building would still belong to the, what, the secular trust. Rationalist. Lesser Rationalist Trust, which I was a member of once. Uh, and the trust would actually have control of the building. If society left it and I was still here, I would say, fine, society can go elsewhere. I'm going to reestablish the Lesser Secular Society and Secular Hall. Whatever you guys want to do elsewise, you go off and do it. So I think the, the Rationalist Trust, if you have, certainly have the right people on it, would still retain the building for secular activities. So that's, that's its future. The only way to get around it is actually um, sell off the building and demolish it. That would, that would be the only way around it. Uh, but, so I see its future as precisely what it does today. It would be nice if there was more money so that they could revamp some of the insides, um, bathroom facilities, whatever. Uh, but the it's being used for what it's supposed to be used for. Okay, and have you got anything you just want to say? About the society? 
uh, so this is you're looking at things that happened in the 90s some kind of historical stuff I'm just I'm just thinking how do you uh, if you wanted to make a comparison between the situation here in, in Britain and the states um, what would you see as the biggest difference for secular issues and secularism uh, well first of all the biggest difference at this point is that people don't care about religion here in the, in the way that um, it is in the state. So you're just not interested. And nobody gets so worried about that. Uh, that's, in fact, the biggest difference. When my wife and I came here, both being atheists, we didn't actually have to... Um, we could carry out our lives without having to be asked, where do you go to church? And questions along this line, which we get asked in Kansas City, where we now live. Uh, so we can just carry our lives without being involved in religion. Of course, we get involved with religion. We have to send our child to school. We have to deal with religion in the school. We don't have that problem in the states because religion is not part of the public school system. And I've actually made arguments in the states dealing with this in public school, which I sent my child to in the 80s. So here we actually have to fight this. Pull your child out of general out of assembly every day. Now that's that's something which you have to go in and do. So we become much more active in having to deal with particular aspects of religion, say in terms of education, but not with our other lo rest of our lives. Whereas in the states, religion in, in public schools is uh, pretty much under control, but we have to deal with it in the rest of our lives in a much more greater extent. Have you one lecture? speaker that you have a particular memory of in your time. Oh, well, this, well, we had a number of them. I, I do finally like to recall, tell them of colleagues in the States that we had a speaker from the Stalinist Society saying how wonderful Stalin was. They still meet here from time to time. Okay. Now, that was really interesting because I didn't realize the Stalinist Society actually existed, so that was interesting. Had an interesting person um, Bob Doyle, maybe, from the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, who gave a talk here. You know, so that was uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, that's only, I remember these because of my particular kinds of interests. I can't... Um, we still have a weekly delivery of an IWW magazine, and yeah? um, one of our members collects them up here, like, and takes them away. Which magazine? IWW. Oh, right. Yeah, but so which nobody ever cancels a subscription, I guess. I don't know. You still have a subscription here. That's interesting.